Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. For those of you I don't know, my name is Sarah Davidson and I am the Chief Executive at the Carnegie UK Trust. We're expecting over 100 people to be joining us today from a really good mix of different sectors to participate in this session about the issues and the priorities for achieving good work in the coronavirus economy. What do we mean by good work? We know that even feeling left behind. At the Trust, we've been pursuing a programme of work for the last five years to understand the key determinants of good work and, the, and structural changes that are needed in order to make good work available to many more people. And why does this matter? Because while being in work is better for well-being than being unemployed, being in work that is poor quality also has seen While we know this, the ongoing coronavirus crisis has severely tested both the ability of the labour market to provide good jobs and the capacity of employers and policymakers to prioritise good work. At the Carnegie UK Trust, where our mission is all about wellbeing, we believe that we need a renewed focus on good work. But we don't underestimate the competing pressures on this agenda, particularly at the moment. As you will know, we recently published a report, Good Work for Wellbeing in the Coronavirus Economy, which sets out our recommendations to protect and advance good work, both through this crisis and as an ambition of the economic recovery afterwards. The purpose of today is very much to share some of our ideas, to hear from some other key voices in the field, and to hear what you think as well, with the aim of really centering our focus on the priorities for good work on the year ahead, not least because the field for issues is so crowded at the moment. I'm absolutely delighted that helping us today is a stellar lineup of speakers who have particular expertise in different aspects of good work. Each of them is going to speak for around about eight minutes to give you a range of perspectives and some food for thought. I'm going to introduce the speakers now all together, and then I will just simply link from one to another once we get started. We're going to hear at the beginning from Gail Irvin, my colleague at the Carnegie UK Trust, Senior Policy and Development Officer, and the author of the report, and she's going to speak to you about the findings it contains. We're then going to hear from Jake Jushande, researcher in the RSA's Economy, Enterprise and Manufacturing team, and he's going to speak about the RSA report, Frontline Fatigue, which looks at the impact of the crisis on key workers. Rosie Stock-Jones, Senior Research Analyst from the Centre of Progressive Policy, is then going to speak about solutions to precarious work and strengthening employment rights. And finally, Ben Wilmot, Head of Policy at the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development, the HR professionals body, is going to speak about workplace practices during the pandemic and the role of people management. I'm also delighted to have us with us today, Douglas White, the Head of Advocacy from the Trust, who's going to lead our panel discussion later on, and my colleague, Rebecca Munro, who's the Zoom host, and who will help us out if we have any technical difficulties. Throughout the event, we want to know what you think. So please do use the Q&A function for all your questions and comments throughout. Don't leave them till the end. Uh, if things occur to you as you go along, please do post them. And that will help Douglas to start thinking ahead to the key areas for discussion and which questions to put forward to the panel later. We're also going to be using the Zoom polling facility uh, to take stock in the mood in the room on some of the big issues. And I'm going to start, therefore, by having the first poll up, if Rebecca could put that up for us. You've got one minute to cast your vote and you can only select one option. Uh, in case anyone's concerned about it, you'll be selecting these anonymously. Okay, and as soon as that's closed, we will get the poll vote results up and get to see what it is we all think.
And there we are. So that's interesting. No, no runaway winner there. Um, just kind of edging it at the top, pay rise for all workers, but but good spread across quite a lot of the other the other dimensions there. I'm going to do a quick capture of it so I can remember what that says later. And I'm going to hand over to Gail to take us into the first presentation. Gail, over to you. Hi, thanks, Sarah. Uh, fantastic. Rebecca, could you? Yes, thank you. Uh, magically bring up our slides uh, and I will get started. So thank you uh, from me as well for everyone who has come along today. I'm absolutely thrilled to have the chance to talk about this report, Good Work for Wellbeing in the COVID Economy, um, which we started work on back at the beginning of all of this madness back in April uh, last year and we published it towards the end of last year. So it's been an ever changing experience to try and think about the place of good work in the COVID context. So for the next few minutes, I'm just going to give you a bit of a flavor of the report and um, the issues that we looked at and the conclusions that we came to and really looking forward to the discussion today. So I just wanted to start out with a bit of background to the research. Uh, in terms of the research process, we held qualitative interviews with 18 labor market experts external to Carnegie including academics, business and trade union representatives, think tanks and campaign groups. And we carried out ongoing desk research of the emerging evidence to examine the main impacts on job quality arising from the pandemic, how these were falling on different groups of workers and how might the crisis impact the overall public debate and policy impetus around good work. And that, I, as a policy idea, good work was something that had really been gaining in traction in the years running up to the pandemic. Uh, and the central idea is that it's not enough that work is simply available, we should also care about the quality of that work, whether it gives people a baseline of security, of dignity, um, of fulfillment. But of course, COVID blew a lot of our expectations out the water and changed the policy landscape significantly. So that's what we were investigating in this report. Uh, next slide, please, Rebecca. So just to clarify before I go any further, what we mean by good work. Uh, the Carnegie UK Trust used a seven dimension framework of good work for, uh, as a framework for our analysis in this report. And I put those seven dimensions up on the slide in front of you. You can see we look at some of the uh, key bread and butter issues like pay and contracts, but also some of these aspects that are very important uh, around health and well-being, voice and representation, social support and cohesion, work-life balance, etc. And this was a framework of job quality that we developed with the RSA back uh, in, uh, in a cross-sectoral working group we convened with the RSA a few years ago. Next slide, please. So one of the key questions that we set out to answer, or at least to gain an early understanding of in the, the research, was this big question of how has job quality been impacted by the COVID crisis across those seven dimensions I just laid out. Now, the key thing to say, of course, is that it's been dramatically different for different groups of workers. So your, the way your working life changed as a, as a result of the pandemic is wildly different depending on whether you were a key worker, whether you've been going out to work in physical workplaces throughout the crisis, whether you've been at the front line interacting with the public, placing yourself at risk of contracting COVID, um, or whether you were someone who has been furloughed in and off of furlough throughout this period, have been unable to work, or whether like many of us in the room today, you have been working from home for the duration. We've all had wildly different experiences of the crisis to date. But in terms of a shorthand, we have created this scorecard, which I'm just gonna talk through briefly. So on pay terms and uh, terms of employment and health, safety and psychosocial well-being, we are concerned that there are significant negative pressures on these key dimensions in the here and now. And there's also likely to be negative long term impacts uh, on pay. Obviously, we have been there's been huge concern about people that have been furloughed on 80 percent of pay, obviously very little to live on if you're on a low wage and um, people that have fallen through the gaps in the coronavirus support schemes and have had to rely on universal credit, statutory sick pay, have seen huge knocks to their household income or have been un unable to get enough hours 
um, because of work, because of the crisis. But going forward, the incredibly difficult trading environment for businesses and the knock on the economy um, poses further risks of negative pressure on pay for some time to come. And that's very concerning considering we've just emerged from a, what they call the lost decade of pay growth for many people it coming out of the last recession. Similarly, on terms of employment, that's things like precarious contracts. We can expect the use of, of those forms of contracts potentially to increase even more um, as employers try and adjust to the dramatically changed business environment. And on health safety and psychosocial well-being, obviously this is a dimension of good work that has really come to the fore during this public health crisis. Uh, and clearly we have all had huge new accelerated pressures on our physical health and well-being as well as mental strain during this period. On the other hand, there has been a renewed discussion about the responsibilities employers have to try and protect their staff's mental and physical health, which could lead us into a better place perhaps on these issues in the future, but we've got a lot of pain to work through first, unfortunately. On work-life balance and job design and nature of work, we're saying that there's different changes occurring for different groups of workers, and we're only at the very early stages of understanding the impacts of all of this. And obviously the most eye-catching change is this mass experiment in remote working that has occurred in many occupations. But there's obviously also been a, a huge rise in e-commerce, different ways of trading, new health and safety procedures that have changed the way people work. And we're at the very early stages of understanding what this all means for job quality uh, and for the labour market more broadly. And finally, on voice and representation, we are saying that we, we think there was an increased recognition of the importance of worker voice um, there's been so many changes, wholesale changes in the way businesses are run and huge changes in terms of people being furloughed. Um, and we had this quite a symbolic development of the government uh, placing requirements on employers to consult their staff on making workplaces COVID secure. But of course, the reality is that employer practice on consulting their staff, engaging their staff is mixed. Um, CIPD research, for example, uh, suggests that only 44% of workers feel they were adequately consulted on the COVID secure practices. And you could also argue perhaps that consultation itself is a bit of a fuzzy word and there's a lack of understanding of what meaningful voice means in non-unionized workplaces. Next slide please, Rebecca. So what do we see needs to happen? The report sets out over 30 recommendations for government employers and civil society to make good, good work part of the COVID-19 labour market. And one of the key messages in the report is that protecting jobs must be a priority. Of course, you can't have job quality unless you have a job. And we are under no illusions about the in incredible pressures on businesses, many businesses just to keep the lights on and to sustain employment during this difficult time. But we also think that there is currently insufficient focus on good work and that we really need to, to, to correct that. Otherwise, we will risk making the same mistakes as the last recession and finding too many people trapped in poor quality work. Uh, otherwise, we will fail to uh, re reward some of the sacrifices that people have made during this period, particularly key workers who have kept the country functioning. And we also know that good work can actually aid the economic recovery because there is a positive correlation between many aspects of good work and improved productivity. Next slide, please, Rebecca. So we have 32 recommendations in the report uh, in terms of what needs to happen. Um, the, I've put the at a glance version up on the slide just now, but I'm not going to talk through them all, obviously. I'm just going to take the last few minutes to uh, hone in on a few uh, important areas of recommendations, just as food for thought for the discussion. Uh, can you go to the final slide, Rebecca? Thank you. So I already talked about health and safety and well-being and how this has really been pushed to the fore in COVID times. We think there needs to be a, a rapid review by government to look at whether the infrastructure and the support, uh, the resources is in place to support employers to fulfil their duty of care to staff in this new environment of, of physical and mental health risks. And if not, we really need to rectify that fast. We need to ensure that the inspection and enforcement regime is fit for purpose in the COVID age, including looking at the remit of the health and safety executive and supporting 
the, the risks of remote working and the risks of working physically in physical workplaces in times of COVID. On job design and work-life balance, uh, as I say, one of the key aspects of that has been this, this shift to remote working. Um, and we want to see evaluations of the impact of remote working uh, that take into account the impacts on individual worker wellbeing, on business outcomes, business productivity, and also look at the ramifications of this shift to, to working uh, remotely on opportunity across the labour market. Those evaluations we think need to take place at a national level, external evaluations, but also within companies as they make decisions. Well, one is they, they manage, they, they work to try and support people now because we're still living through this, um, but also as they make decisions going forward about future job design. And we need to ensure that employers are, are signposted towards the wealth of resources that currently exist to help them support their teams to work remotely during this challenging period. And the final column, um, well, these two key areas I've just spoken about, health, safety, job design and work-life balance, they're two areas where worker voice absolutely has to be heard. Uh, and that was a theme that ran through the report, was the need to ensure worker voices are heard. Um, we, don't, we have not done very well on that in the UK in recent decades. And for us, we think improving worker voice is, requires a two-pronged approach. One is about removing barriers to trade unions, so that they have greater rights of access to workers. Um, but the other is about identifying and strengthening other mechanisms for voice which are shown to be effective. And a starting point for that in our view is that we need to have an evaluation of the extent of consultation that has occurred in workplaces during the pandemic. What forms of consultation have worked? What have the outcomes been? And we need to strengthen the guidance for employers and perhaps requirements on employers to meaningfully give, meaningfully give voice to their workers during all of the changes still to come. So I'm going to draw to a close there. I'm mindful of time. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much, Gail. That was uh, a really helpful reminder of the key points in the, in the report for us all. Jake, I'm just going to seamlessly hand over to you and invite you to take us into your set of slides. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Gail. Um, so as Sarah said, my name is Jake Dushande. I work for the RSA. I'm a researcher with the economy team, um, particularly focusing on the future of work and this idea of good work as well. And I'm going to talk a bit about our latest research on key workers. So our report came out in December. It was called Frontline Fatigue. And it was the second in the series. Um, so next slide, please. So um, just as a bit of background to the research. So the overall project is called the Economic Security Observatory. As I said, there's been two reports so far. The third one will be out in around March or April this year. Um, and it began last summer and revolves around a concept that we describe as the security trap. So the security trap for us is, is stems from the idea of good work and is about the trade-offs that people face between, for instance, job security, financial security, mental health, family life, and social lives. Um, and in this instance, we obviously talk particularly about key workers because it's obviously highly topical and very interesting. And the fact that these groups face really unique challenges that other people don't face. Um, so within the surveys, we tracked um, metrics around financial lives, psychology, psychological lives, social and family lives of key workers. Um, so I was going to give a brief overview of some of the key findings from both reports, but I'm a bit conscious of time. So what I'm going to do is skip the next slide and just talk first of all about uh, mental health. So mental health was a huge area that came out from both reports. It's obviously been in the news lately. Um, in the last couple of days, there was a report from King's College London, I believe it was, that spoke about uh, the level of trauma in the NHS, very sadly. Um, and this was big in our reports as well. So the NHS in particular were fake, said they were far more likely to find it difficult to maintain their mental health in both our July last year and November last year. And obviously with the level of cases now probably getting worse. Um, and in November last year as well, uh, NHS staff said to us that they were they were fearing that they would face burnout this winter, which um, sadly is probably being borne out right now. Obviously, other you can see from the survey there that other key workers were also finding um, 
were struggling to maintain their mental health as well. But this came out most strongly for the NHS. Um, so what can we do about this? Well, next slide, please. So the um, very obvious thing to say is that there's no easy fix with this. It's difficult and it will require time and ongoing support and management. Um, but working with, we spoke to people, for instance, like the Royal College of Nursing, who um, deal with these cases a lot and have done a lot of research on this. And our recommendation in our November report was to have immediately have ongoing psychological support for all key workers and with this to have a particular focus on trauma support given the news in the last few days um, but long term and following on from this we need to think about the sort of systemic issues that the NHS faces such as chronic understaff understaffing because the issue of mental health in the NHS is not nothing new even last year before the pandemic so January 2020 exactly a year ago um, one quarter of all the days lost in the NHS were due to stress and mental health problems as well. So this is a problem that pre-existed and has become worse um, through the pandemic and it's something we're going to be facing with for the next year or more to come um, and is borne out in our research as well. Um, next slide, please. So the second big theme that came out for us, which I, I glanced over earlier, but to say that one of the key things that came out of our research was that many key workers, like many people in the labor market in general, have done relatively financially well in the pandemic. It sounds a bit wrong to say, but they, like many of us, have had stable jobs and have kept their income at their normal levels while also being constrained in how much you can spend. So the ONS has released data recently about the fact that uh, the British economy has managed to save far more than they normally do, and this is true for many key workers as well. The notable exceptions, as I say here, are for social carers and for shop market uh, shop workers as well. This is likely because, to be honest, they were already facing financial insecurity even before the pandemic, and this has continued. Um, so within our surveys, as it says here, we found that carers were most worried about their level of debt. They were least able to pay a surprise bill of £100, so I think between shop workers and carers around one in four said they would struggle to pay a surprise bill of hundred pounds. Um, most were worried about their finances after the pandemic as well. So thinking to the future, they were still worried. And social carers, uh, this is a big issue for me, social carers were most likely, were the most likely key workers to forgo earnings to isolate due to COVID. So they're almost twice as likely as the average key worker to rely on statutory sick pay if they were forced to isolate which is only about 95 pounds a week or 200 pounds ish for the two weeks you need to isolate, which is hardly anything to live on. Um, and they were twice as likely to be completely unpaid as well if they were isolating due to the virus. And this obviously has huge consequences for our pandemic response and management of the virus as well. Uh, next slide, please. So what can we do? Uh, what does this mean for social care? Um, I focus particularly on social care here because obviously they were struggling financially, but there's bigger questions about how we finance social care in the future, and it has uh, repercussions for how we manage the pandemic both now and in the future. Um, within our report, uh, last report in November, Frontline Fatigue, we called for the real living wage for all key workers. This would primarily benefit social carers and shop workers because they were the biggest groups that didn't have that didn't already earn above that amount for instance the nhs virtually everyone in the nhs already earns above the real living wage so they're relatively immune from that but around 37 percent uh, we calculated of social carers and below the real living wage so that would help a significant number of people um, and to give them the ruling real living wage would have a number of benefits Firstly, obviously, it would reduce economic insecurity for what is rightly considered a critical public service, especially now more than ever. Um, pay is critical to reducing turnover and vacancies in the care sector. So this has been a problem, a chronic problem for years. It is known to cause uh, reduced um, quality of care in the care sector. And it is also known to be a, one of the leading causes of the amount of agency staff who flip between different care homes um, because of the chronic understaffing. And this early in the pandemic had consequences for 
how the virus is being transmitted through care homes, for instance. So if we paid people more, we attract more people to the sector, reduce turnover, reduce, vac reduce vacancies, we could help some of these problems. And then finally, obviously, better sick pay would reduce the disincentive to isolate, which I mentioned earlier, as it, which is, to me, one of the sort of key last pieces of the puzzle in terms of how we can make sure that people stay at home and we um, manage the pandemic effectively. Um, but to fund all of these um, issues above, because of the nature of the care sector in that much of it is private um, and commissioned by local services who are struggling with their finances as well, a more permanent solution to how we fund social care is needed. So whether that's an insurance model that's been floated around or we simply limit how much um, individuals can have to spend on their own care, for instance, or a combination of any of the many ideas that are floating around, we need a, a more practical, permanent government-led solution to social care to fix these problems. Um, actually, I did that a lot quicker than I was expecting. So <laughs> um, that's me done. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jig. And I'm sure there'll be an opportunity later in the uh, questions if you want to pick up any of the uh, the data from the other report as well. Thank you for that. Rosie, over to you. Hi. Um, yeah, so my name's Rosie and I'm a senior researcher at Centre for Progressive Policy. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the kind of challenges to good work that arise from disputed employment status and the use of insecure contracts like zero hours. Um, and most of what I'm going to talk about is based on a paper that we published last October, uh, which was called Precarious to Prosperous, How We Can Build Back a Better Labour Market. Um, and what was the kind of motivation behind this paper really was a desire, as Gail mentioned, to avoid repeating the rising levels of uh, precarity and in-work poverty we saw following the last recession after the 2008 financial crisis. Um, and I don't know, I think I agree in that despite growing concerns about unemployment, I think the issue of in-work poverty and the role of insecure work in causing it remains really relevant. Um, so I'm going to talk for a few minutes about uh, why less secure forms of work might be a problem and what we can do to kind of maybe solve some of those issues. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, so the first thing to say is that the number of people working in insecure roles appears to be rising. And the latest ONS figures show that the number of people on zero hours contracts in the UK rose to over a million last year, which is up 80% since 2013. Um, and an estimated one in 10 are also working in the gig economy. Although, you know, this figure is actually a bit less reliable because there aren't, isn't any official uh, regular data collected on gig or task-based work. Um, and as Gail mentioned, the uncertainty generated by the pandemic creates additional incentives for employers to offer less secure work. So it seems reasonable to expect that we're gonna see the number of insecure contracts rise next year as well. Um, and we know that those in precarious work are more likely to be low paid and that the low paid, uh, typically women, young people, and those from ethnic minority backgrounds are more likely to become have become unemployed or underemployed as a result of the pandemic. So, and also that those in precarious work are also, as Jake mentioned, the same people we've identified as key workers. Um, so really coming back to the question of why insecure contracts are a problem, it's because they're disproportionately impacting um, people who are more vulnerable groups in our society um, and people who, you know, we're saying have been really important to us in the, um, in the past year. Next slide, please. So continuing on the theme of an imbalance of power, uh, another aspect of the kind of insecure work and contract issues um, is that the rights of those in insecure roles, particularly doing task-based work, often aren't very clear. Um, and that's because the distinction between self-employed and workers uh, who are entitled to a lot more protections than the self-employed um, is the subject of quite a lot of debate and quite a few legal cases uh, with the most prominent UK case at the moment being Uber versus Aslam. Um, so at the moment, the situation with that particular case is that 
uh, courts have ruled that Uber drivers are workers, so they should have entitlement to holiday pay, um, rest breaks and things like that. But Uber have appealed the decision and we're currently waiting on a final decision from the Supreme Court. So I guess one of the main things to take away from this is de deciding um, employment status is actually not very simple. And this complexity means that workers often are in practice unable to access their existing rights. Um, and so tribunals and courts have actually done a really good job of trying to make sure that employment rights aren't restricted. But the whole process of taking your employer to a tribunal is time consuming, it's potentially stressful, um, it, you know, could dissuade a lot of people from making the claim, particularly where it's not clear whether or not they've got a good case. Uh, next slide, please. So at CPP, um, we think that one solution to this problem would be to make it a bit clearer, um, the, the difference between workers and self-employed, so that there's less confusion in the first place, and there's a bit more uh, transparency and information. And one thing this could involve is introducing a statutory presumption that a person is a worker, not self-employed, unless it could be proven otherwise. And this, this just essentially would flip the situation on its head uh, and ensure that um, rather than kind of having bogus self-employed who are taking employers to employment tribunals, workers receive their rights in the first instance rather than after the fact. Um, and, and it kind of changes the power balance in the relationship. Um, and something else we think could be done would be to update secondary legislation to reflect some of the more recent case law, um, making the distinction between self-employed and workers clearer to employers and staff and avoid some of the confusion. Next slide, please. Um, and then in terms of insecure contracts, uh, one of the more powerful things that we think could be done is to stop the use of zero hours contracts, which um, personally I think are pretty symbolic of an employment model that just isn't really working for a lot of people. Um, and that could be achieved in many ways. One would be to introduce regulation that sets out the rights of workers to a minimum number of hours. Um, but another would be for public bodies and potentially large corporations to kind of exclude businesses that use zero hour contracts from their procurement um, contracts and supply chains. So whatever the means really, we'd really like to see the direction of travel on zero hours contracts reversed. Um, because since 2018, the number of contracts has been rising. And over the last year, we saw quite a large increase in the health and social care sector, which has got a, quite a high proportion of key workers, which is what Jake was talking about earlier as well. Um, so the main point here, I think, is that we saw these more precarious contract, uh, contracts proliferate after the last crisis. And we just we don't really want to see that happen again this time. Um, this time we want to see more productivity growth. We want to see a better deal for workers, including key workers, um, which means they're not going to be so exposed whenever the next crisis, <laughs> not to talk about that too much, occurs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so finally, as well as introducing more protections, part of the solution to contractual challenges to good work is to ensure um, that people's existing rights are protected, understood and enforced. Um, and this is particularly important now the UK has left the EU, as some rights are likely to be a bit more vulnerable to revision. And it's not that it's not that the government have suggested they want to reform worker rights, but there is a bit of a risk that companies like Uber, for example, could start to lobby the government to reduce worker rights if, for example, they lose their appeal in the Supreme Court. Um, and because of this, we think that it would be great if the government could signal their intention to protect worker rights and show they're not open to that kind of lobbying. Um, and one of the ways they could do this would be to prioritise the setup of a single labour market enforcement body, which is something they've committed to. But Importantly, you know, we've said that we think this body needs to be fully funded to carry out inspections, to run a free confidential advice helpline, for example, and also to make sure that we improve transparency um, in company level data. Um, so really what I've been trying to outline is that there's some quite technical details around the way that workers are classified and the type of contracts they have. 
of their employers that can have quite a big impact on the paying conditions that people experience. And, you know, this pandemic has really highlighted the divide um, between people with, you know, good secure jobs and people who have a more precarious existence um, and revealed that many of those on the more precarious side are also the people we've identified as key workers. Um, but, but these things aren't inevitable. You know, there are lots of policy levers that could change the current power dynamic. Um, and yeah, as I've, as I've been talking about, I think three of the things that we think at CPP would make a big difference are, you know, making this issue of employment status clearer in our law, uh, eliminating use of zero hours contracts and protecting um, and enforcing existing rights. So that's it from me. I'm looking forward to the panel discussion in a bit. Thanks very much, Rosie. And it's great to see so many uh, questions and comments coming in for the panel already. So do keep, uh, do keep putting those up um, while equally paying attention to our final speaker on the panel, which is uh, Ben. So I shall hand over to you, Ben. That's your slides up now. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm going to try and touch on three issues. We'll see how we go in terms of time. I might have to truncate things slightly. Um, but broadly, I'm going to highlight why people management skills have been so important to organisations uh, during the, the pandemic. Critical at all times, but absolutely critical uh, during the crisis. Um, then I'm going to touch briefly on some findings from some of uh, some pilots we've run where we've provided HR support to small firms around, you know, how do you build small firm people management capability? Um, and then finally, uh, some work we've done around um, uh, revamping um, labour market enforcement and um, some recommendations, but we'll see how we go. Um, and next slide, please. So, and what's come through strongly in the research we've done and, and in our engagement with, with members um, since the start of the pandem pandemic has been the, the critical importance of anyone who's responsible for managing people, having core people management skills. Um, as Gail has said, the, the pandemic has affected people in very different ways, depending on their job, uh, the sector they work in, their personal characteristics in terms of you know, their age, their gender, their race, their health, um, whether they have caring responsibilities, for example. Th this means that the, the role of the line manager is absolutely key in understanding the, the varying challenges that individuals face and the type of support or flexibility that, that people need. Uh, we've conducted significant research in, in the line management behaviours required to support employee engagement and to manage and prevent stress uh, in the workplace over the last few years. And we've now translated these into tools and guidance um, for employers on our website. And there are broadly five key behavioural areas for line managers that are critical to supporting uh, in engagement, motivation, um, and people's uh, health and well-being, I'll just touch on them, them briefly because they are a framework that um, really are is, is key to underpinning trust in the employment relationship. Um, so, the first one is around being open, fair, and consistent, and this is really about uh, managers um, being accessible, um, being um, uh, able to manage their emotions effectively, not pass stress on, um, and treating people fairly, impartially, and consistently. The second area is around um, the, the the proactive management of problems. So are, are managers confident in um, picking up uh, issues or, or problems like conflict or, or absence at an early stage, um, and um, dealing with them um, informally where they can to try and make sure that they don't escalate, but where they need to, having the confidence to use uh, formal processes and support. Um, third critical area is around providing knowledge, um, clarity and guidance. So this is very much around um, providing clarity over objectives, uh, communicating expectations clearly, clearly and providing constructive uh, feedback. This is also about joint problem solving, help managers helping individuals to, to resolve problems and um, coach them through them. Um, the fourth area, uh, and this has been particularly crucial during the pandemic, is around building and sustaining relationships. This is really about you know, 
do your managers know their people? Do they know them as individuals? Do they have some knowledge of the challenges that they're facing outside uh, the workplace and demonstrating that they, they care about them as human beings? Because um, that's crucial at the moment is, is you know, how managers provide uh, flexibility and support relative to these, these very different challenges that, that people are facing, whether they are working from home um, or um, have they have been um, working uh, you know, in the physical workplace uh, during the pandemic, that, that relationship and really understanding people and whether regardless of, of their, their, uh, their backgrounds, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's crucial to the issue of trust and also whether people will disclose sensitive uh, information, like you know, if they have a mental health problem, they unless they feel that their manager really cares about them, they won't disclose those issues. So it's crucial. And the sorts of behaviours we talk about are empathy and listening and um, real clarity around communication, finding time to talk to people. And the final area is around uh, supporting development. So do managers coach and support? Do they provide opportunities for training? Um, do they uh, help individuals progress and think about their longer term career uh, progression opportunities? So broadly, our research tells us that these, man these, these behaviours are critical to and underpin the employment relationship. And as I said, have been particularly important uh, during the pandemic, but are important at all, at all times uh, in the modern workplace. Um, unfortunately, we know that only about 40% of line managers say that they have received any training in, in how to manage people. So I think there's, you know, there is without doubt much more um, that many organizations need to do to uh, improve how they, they manage and support people. Um, next slide, please. Now, we know that small firms in particular have challenges around, around how they, they manage people. Um, CIPD has been over the last four years running a number of pilots uh, where we have provided free HR, HR support to small firms. Uh, firstly, supported by JP Morgan Foundation, we ran pilots in Glasgow, in Stoke and Hackney East London. And latterly, we have had funding from Bayes, the Business Basics Fund, to run a pilot um, in Birmingham. Um, and that pilot has just finished. But some of the some of the findings, um, I think, uh, well, certainly across all pilots, um, are really important when we think about well, how can we uh, in encourage, enable, support uh, owner managers in small firms to improve how they how they manage and invest in their people? Um, and I'll move on to these. Next slide, please. So, you know what what we found um, and. Uh, you know, we you know, organizations like ACAS are very aware of these challenges as well. Um, that owner managers are are time and resource poor, um, so it's it, it's quite difficult for them to to find the money to invest in in people management. They're also much more reactive. They don't think long term about their businesses, and so some of those sort of the things that they might need to think about longer term, they 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 just don't find the time to, to get to. And they have fewer formal HR practices than large organisations. In, in many cases, those, those, those HR practices are virtually non-existent for small firms with 50 or fewer staff. And they, they lack expertise and knowledge in people management. So they might recognise that they need to, uh, obviously, they, you know, how do they access finance? How do they market their business? Um, you know, they might think, well, they'll recognise they need to develop the digital capability, but they won't recognise or understand um, people management and linked to my last last point is that they that they don't know what they don't know and they won't proactively um, uh, invest in improving how they manage their people. Uh, next slide please. So what we found is uh, when we've been providing this type of support is that um, getting the people management basics is in place is crucial to creating good work and boosting workplace productivity. What we found is that the, the sort of support, and we, we provide this by um, usually one or two days of free HR support from an H, uh, uh, a CIPD qualified HR consultant, is 
um, the, the sort of support that these owner managers need is very basic. Quite often, it's about making sure there are written employment contracts in place, making sure that um, the uh, people have uh, written terms, conditions of employment, job descriptions, even things like objectives. Managers, the owner managers don't know how to recruit people um, without uh, concerns about bias or discrimination. What we also found is when, when you do provide this, this sort of support, it is potentially transformational. And the, uh, the intervention of the uh, pilots, which we've um, run, uh, which we've had evaluated to date, suggest that this type of support is associated with improvements in workplace relations, labor productivity and financial outcomes for firms that access this support. We also found that um, people skills support needs, this type of support needs to be embedded in trusted local networks and ecosystems. So where we've run these successfully, um, for example, we ran the, uh, our pilot in Stoke very successfully. Um, that was because it was run um, on our behalf via the, um, the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and through the, the Growth Hub in Stoke. Um, and so that seems to be critical that you, you've got to have these, these trusted um, networks and, and ecosystems for to deliver this type of support. We also found that bespoke face-to-face -face support makes a difference, that a website or an online tool is not sufficient in itself. In order to have the, the eureka moment where owner managers recognize that actually this is really important, that they, they think about how they manage people, then they need to speak to someone who really understands the subjects, a professional um, ACAS advisor or, or a, a professionally qualified CIPD HR consultant, for example. Um, and longer term commitment to building small firm um, people management capability is crucial um, because this doesn't happen fast. And but what we found is in environments like Glasgow, we ran this um, in pilot is um, where employers are already um, more used to, to um, accessing support uh, provided by, uh, for example, by the city council. They were the demand was much higher. So you know, I I think you really do need to to provide this type of support over the long term. Um, and what we've also found is that people skills type support can help pump prime greater demand. And this is one of the big challenges that, that you know, not enough um, small firm owner managers actually recognize that this is a priority. Um, but what we found is that when they've had their, their taster, when they, that they give them the Eureka moment, why this is fundamental to the long-term su success of their business, uh, then they're more likely to invest in off their own bat. Now we've, we've um, estimated that you could run a people skills type um, uh, service across all LEPs in England, for example, uh, for uh, a cost of about 13 million pounds a year. Um, and so, you know, it, it, in, it isn't a, a huge uh, government investment, it's a treasury rounding error. Um, and yet, you know, at the moment, and this isn't just this government, but government typically um, over the last, you know, sort of 20 years has been reluctant to really invest in the demand side of skills. And I think if we're going to see longer term change, that needs to make, we, we need a, a different understanding of you know, what is going to catalyze greater investment in skills and technology um, so that you know we, we start to see improvements in, in productivity and uh, and job quality over time. I'll leave it there. I've got more slides, but I recognize I probably overran already. Um, and maybe we'll come back to the discussion around um, labor market enforcement um, uh, during the questions. Thanks very much, Ben, and uh, thanks to all the panellists for that. Before we come to pick up the uh, questions in discussion, we're going to have a second poll. As Gail said earlier on, the recommendations in the Carnegie report were addressed to a number of actors in the system. And what we're interested to hear from you now is who you think the most important actors will be in terms of addressing these issues. So Rebecca, if you could pop up the next poll and we'll give people a moment to have a look at that. And again, it's... Uh, just one question. So we're looking for your, your number one answer to this question.
And just while we're waiting for the results there, this is your chance. If there's anything that's at the front of your mind that you'd like to be uh, asked to the panellists uh, or comments you'd like to be shared, then do, do pop that in. And Douglas, who's been keeping an eye on that, will start picking pictures, picking questions up and passing them around the panellists in a moment. And there, isn't that interesting? Tied, tied exactly for, for top place, uh, UK government and employers. Uh, and uh, we certainly heard some strong examples in those last presentations of things which both the UK government and employers could, could well and justly be attending to. So thank you for that. I'm now going to hand over to Douglas, who's going to facilitate our question and answer session today. Douglas, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you to everyone for their, their presentations and to everyone um, attending for all the, the comments and questions that you've put in the Q&A and the chat function so far. Um, for such a broad topic is good work. Unsurprisingly, we have a very diverse set of questions, which is fantastic. And we'll try and get through as many of those as we can. And please do continue to add them to the, to the different functions as we move through. and We'll try and pick up um, as, as many as possible. Where I want to start, and I'll, Gail, I'll come to you um, first of all, and then we'll We'll come around the panel on this one is a question about inequality and in access to good work and um, i think all of all of you talked about a whole broad set of broad set of issues or, or specific sets of issues from your sectors in relation to good work we've had a number of questions reflecting that the access to good work isn't equal for all members of society um, and that actually um that the lack of access to good work often reflects other social and economic inequalities that exist in society so what? So, so, so I think the question that, that comes through a number of the, the the points that people have raised is what are the specific actions that are needed to tackle inequality in access to good work, and which particular um, groups in society might some of those um, actions be particularly best um, targeted towards? So, Gail, I'm going to come to you to open with that one first of all, and then we'll move around with, with and get some thoughts from. Um, from Jake, Rosie and Ben on that question as well, because it feels absolutely kind of fundamental to a lot of the issues that, that we've been exploring. Gail. Thanks, Douglas. Yeah, it's a very, very big question to kick us off on. Um, and yeah, we did, we looked in some detail at the different groups that are seem to have been most adversely affected by the pandemic. Um, but many of those groups were the groups that went into the pandemic with least access to good quality work and having to, to fight against some of these structural issues in terms of low pay, lack of availability of hours um, in the pre-COVID economy. Um, so I think tackling the inequalities is, is obviously um, requires multiple different initiatives uh, and it's both cultural change, economic change and some of the more micro level changes within bus individual businesses. If you look at, for example, women, you know, we know there's there's lo lots of new research out by the TUC today, for example, indicating the extent to which women are um, really struggling trying to combine the bulk of childcare with staying in their work and being turned down for furlough requests from their employers. And even though they are legally entitled to be furloughed to do childcare during this pandemic. So if you look at that problem, there's clearly a lack of communication from government on the policies on the, 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 the mechanisms through which employers can furlough women. There's also perhaps cultural biases and, and discrimination within the workforce within individual businesses. Um, and then there's the whole societal problem of why are women doing all of the childcare in the first place? So I think it's, it's quite difficult to um, some of these problems feel very overwhelming because there's so many different parts that need to be resolved. And I think very similarly with social care, you know, we, the other um, key driver of some of these inequalities is the sectoral dynamics at work in different industries and sectors. Uh, and Jake obviously spoke a bit about social care and some of the structural problems there in terms of its funding model. Um, so there's... <laughs> I think I've already listed about six different areas where someone needs to notice the problem and articulate solutions and convincingly sell them uh, to an electorate, to business models, in order to see change for some of these groups. Um, but I'll stop there for other people to pick up on many of the, the spreads of that question. Thank, thanks, Gail. Jake, do you want to give us a couple of thoughts quickly? Yeah, sure. Um, 
like Gail said, it is a very big question in terms of inequality and access to good care. I think what first sprung to mind for me was an issue around one-sided flexibility, which people might have heard of or might not have heard of. Um, in my mind, it's almost a uniquely British problem in that flexibility, it, a lot of you know zero hour contract work, uh, gig economy work is very flexible, is very flexible for the worker. More often than not, especially in the case of zero hour contracts, it's, more, it's far more flexible for the employer and it benefits them more than it does the employee. There are obviously employees who uh, like those contracts and they like how they run. Others don't want that and want more permanent contracts. I think I saw yesterday that um, the majority of people in gig work are looking for permanent work. It's just what, that's the only thing that is available to them at the time. Um, but this is, as I said, it's a uniquely British problem. It does happen elsewhere in the world, but if we look at other countries in Europe, for instance, um, you are able to regulate to ensure that uh, workers have rights and have stronger rights than they do here in the UK. So for instance, I think it's in the Netherlands, after a few months of being on a, a zero hours contract, you are then automatically offered a contract for the average amount of hours you were working for those previous three months. So it's, it's a defined period that you're on a zero hour contract. You can accept that or you can reject it. It's up to you at that point. But my point is that with regulatory change and with greater recognition of these different types of non-traditional work, you can um, give better access to good work for everyone. Thanks, Jake. Rosie, would you like to say a couple of words on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think that question is really relevant to a lot of the policy uh, solutions that I was touching on earlier. Um, so uh, tackling inequality and access to good work, I think, you know, as Jake just said, eliminating zero hours, the use of zero hours contracts would be a really good start to that as we're trying to you know clarify um some of the employment status issues so you don't have people who are in bogus self-employment roles who all you know it tends to be the same set of people you're looking at the people who are low paid who tend to be in insecure work who are also kind of the less well-off groups in society you know you see the same kind of groups coming up and i think um I guess I think strengthening the power dynamics and worker voice, like including you know, particularly through um, better enforcement uh, would really help as well. Cause I think that's a lot of what's off at the moment is the kind of power dynamic. And part of that is the one-sided flexibility that Jake mentions. Um, and just quickly in terms of which groups, I think, yeah, social care and uh, social carers and women are like really obvious places to start. Um, and personally, I also think now is a really good opportunity for us to focus on um, key workers and key workers groups who are maybe aren't getting access to good work, because I think it's such an obvious case um, that they should be right now that it's maybe quite a good policy opportunity to, to push for that. And that's maybe a group to start with. Thanks, Rosie. And Ben, final word for you on this, this question. Yeah, I'd probably pick up Rosie's point around um, uh, improving labour market enforcement. Um, if I was going to, I think there's, there's various areas of policy you could look at, but I was going to pick one. Um, that would be the, the area where I think we've got the, you know, possibly the biggest challenge. We know CRD does a, an annual uh, UK Working Lives survey of, of job quality. And um, our most recent one showed that about 2 million, if you extrapolate it, about the equivalent of about 2 million people believe that they um, have been discriminated against on the basis of a, of a protected characteristic um, in the last year. Uh, that was published in 2020. So it's, it's pre-pandemic data, um, but I doubt it's got any better and it may well have got worse. Now, of course, of that 2 million, um, you know, not everyone will, will pass the burden of proof necessary to, to go to an employment tribunal. But if, it, if we say even 25%, that's, that's, uh, um, that's half a million people who have faced significant discrimination to the point which you know they they could potentially seek redress uh, at an employment tribunal. We know the employment tribunal system is drowning at the moment. Um, average waits, you know, nearly a year, even if you do go down a route. Um, and then we've got um, you know we're still waiting for the government response to the consultation on the single uh, um, enforcement body. Um, you know, our view 
uh, just picking up on on the bit of the, the presentation I didn't have time to deliver, but um, when our report on on uh, revamping labour market enforcement makes the point that as well as significantly strengthening state-based enforcement, um, uh, there needs to be a much greater focus on uh, supporting employers to to comply to improve employment standards, um, because a lot of this is is not necessarily malicious or bad employers. It's quite often ignorant and badly resourced employers. And in, unless we we spend more focus on helping, particularly small employers which have limited resources to improve how they manage people, then we're not going to see a step change, and people will still not have their existing rights. And I think that's the key thing. Let's make sure we enforce our existing employment rights first and really nail that. Um, and that's the least that people should expect um, in uh, you know, the modern workplace in the UK. Thank you for that, uh, Ben. I thank you to all the panelists. Ben, that was a be beautiful segue actually into the, the next area of questioning I wanted to explore because a lot of the questions that we've had essentially relate to some of the things that you, you're talking about there is, how do we kind of make this, this happen in practice? Where is more enforcement required? Where do we need to provide more incentives to employers? And where do employers just need more support um, in order to make um, different things happen, whether that's around childcare or consulting with people and, and having the, the kind of the space and the time and the kind of the skills and expertise to, to do that. So I'd like, I'd like to kind of come around each of the panel and ask you to pick I suppose one of those three areas is a slightly false choice, but one of those three areas around kind of support for employers, incentivization, so things like using procurement, et cetera, to, to reward employers who support good work, or enforcement. Which of those do you feel is the most important? And in the area that you select, what would be the action that you would pick um, that, that, that would have the greatest impact on improving good work? Um, so let's let's change change order um, a bit this time. And Jake, I'll, I'll come to you first of all, if that's if that's okay to pick up on that one. Uh, sure. Let me. Um, still thinking it through a little bit, but I'll, I'll have a go. My my first thoughts was leading on from um, what Ben said, in terms of. I don't know if this is necessarily be the best, but I know this is a, a an area that needs a lot of work in that. A lot of employers and employees, as Ben said, simply don't know what the regulation is at the moment. Um, partly through a lack of, I don't know, a lack of knowledge that's out there, lack of um, trying to find the knowledge that's out there, and maybe assumptions based on what other people think as well. So a very obvious one is um, the fact that it's to do with bogus self-employment, the fact that um, employees are not what you say they are on paper, they are what how you treat them. So if you if uh, somebody works for you acts like an employee and they work exclusive, exclusively for you, they are an employee, not a self-employed person, even if you say so on their contract. And that is not well known amongst a lot of employers, especially smaller employers who maybe rely on those types of contracts. And it's not known um, amongst employees either. So support for employers in that sense, in terms of knowledge and um, outreach, I think would be helpful. Thanks, Jake. Um, Gail, I'll come to you next on this, and then we'll come to Ben and Rosie. I think it is impossible to choose just one. I know you we sh you want me to do so, but I think, um, I suppose with, you know, if you start from the premise, most employers don't want to provide bad work. You know, I think most people generally don't want to have, have their, their staff miserable and to create miserable working lives. So there is a lack of just knowledge and constant nudging towards approaches that could improve work for, for people and get that kind of virtuous circle going in terms of good work, good worker performance. Um, but I would suggest that incentivization and the risk of real enforcement, a stronger sense that that will happen to employers probably drives a more urgent response including from those employers that are just very time poor that Ben was talking about, but also from those who think that, particularly in a time of high unemployment, if staff don't like the job, they'll just move on and it's less the responsibility of the employer to improve the current work for the current workforce. So I would lean towards incentivization and enforcement, but also we shouldn't forget another dimension, which is about how do we strengthen this on the side of workers in terms of their understanding of their rights and their confidence and their real power to actually challenge worker uh, terms and conditions. And that feels like one of the biggest challenges going into a period of higher unemployment. 
Thanks, Gil. Ben. Yeah, you won't be surprised to hear that my view is uh, if we're going to focus on one, I'd go for support for, for employers. I mean, I, I agree with Gail, but I think I'm, if I'm put you know, on a spot, I'm going to choose support for employers. Um, I mean, the sorts of things that we recommended um, in our revamping labour market enforcement report were um, doubling ACAS's budget to um, boost their capacity to um, work at, with employers, particularly small employers, and help individuals around issues around employment rights. Um, I think um, one thing we'd like to see would be um, uh, tribunals having the, the, the right reinstated to make recommendations uh, to improve employer practices. Um, uh, uh, previously, that was purely in relation to equality issues, but actually we think, uh, you know, in, in relation to all jurisdictions, um, if, if tribunals had that um, power, then and then you could get the, the relevant enforcement body to oversee that order to make sure that the employer actually followed through and, and did um, and you know with support from ACAST improve their their people management practices so that you're actually seeing improvements in standards. The other thing I'd, I'd say is, and this is the um, reference to the uh, very good uh, Carnegie RSA report looking at the link between um, productivity um, and job quality and, and what so I think it was Warwick. Um, you'll correct me, no doubt. Um, that uh, found that uh, if you were going to um, make improvements in, in productivity, um, the, you'd get most bang for your buck by looking at improving um, the worst uh, employment um, to, up, to, up, to the, up to the median rather than looking to move the medium up to the best. And so I think a focus on improving employment standards through a much more uh, compliance and supportive approach to um, improving employment rights would also help improve workplace productivity as well. And so that's that's why I, that gets my bet if I'm asked to sit on one particular um, area. Which you are, and thank you for, and thank you for, <laughs> for answering it, that's great. Rosie. Um, yeah, so I think I'd, I'd probably cheat and say incentivization, but I think, to be honest, I think that encompasses the other two as well, because really I think the important thing is doing something that will make a practical difference um so however you can kind of incentivize that difference to be made i think you know there's i think something that can be done is that central local government and also large businesses um can be really clear about the employment standards they expect uh through their supply chains and in their procurement contracts and that can be a really good way of incentivizing businesses to kind of get up to a minimum standard and to kind of raise the bar a little bit um but i do think that enforcement is also important and i think that's an incentive in itself for businesses i think you know if, if we don't show any leadership in terms of enforcement of the real basics like um minimum wage and discrimination then i think it's kind of quite difficult to expect businesses to kind of spend their time and resources in complying so yeah. Great, thank you. So we still have around 10 minutes for questions and to enable us to get through um, as many of these as we can, what I'll do is I'll not come around all the panel for the rest, the rest of the other questions, but I'll ask maybe each of you just to indicate if you'd like to come in on, on one. Um, so we've had a question, which I think is, is, is pretty fundamental, which is about the relationship between the welfare system and good work. And um, what more, what changes would, would, would might be required to how the welfare system operates in order to help and support and sustain people and secure people in good quality work. And I wonder if, if any of you would like to come in and say something on that question. Gail, you looked as though you were moving towards on mute. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'll just I'll just thank say that I think it's, it's a great question um, from Katie and I think the we, we all know that there's been endemic problems in the welfare system in the UK for some time. Um, so I suppose we because we haven't exited the, the furlough scheme and these big life support things that are on the economy right now, we're still in many regards to see how the Department of Work and, and Pensions will respond to the new challenge ahead. Um, I think you would, 
you would hope that there, there would be both a cultural change, a change in the systems and processes in the, in the social security system. And of course, many people have been campaigning to maintain the uplift in universal credit and to generally increase the generosity of payments for people. So it's a more dignified experience that doesn't traumatize people as they go in and out of work. Um, I think there's also scope, you know, if we're moving into a period of high unemployment um, and one of the pressures within DWP in terms of providing a more humane, supportive environment to people to find work has been lack of resources themselves because of the money that's come out of government departments over the last 10 years. So you could start as a, as a UK government by hiring many, many more people from the new masses of unemployed to be job coaches and job centres. To, to change the way that they interact, the time that they spend with people and the, the conditionality on people so that they are given a more substantial support uh, to find work. But um, we don't really know if the, those are real possibilities at the moment and how ambitious uh, the current government is on tackling, uh, or ch changing the direction of travel within uh, the benefit system in the UK. Thanks, Gil. Um, Okay, I'm going to let Ben come in and then Rosie, I'll move on to the next question if that's okay and come to you for, for that one if that's right, just so we can get another one or two in hopefully. Ben, quickly. I, I'll just quickly on this, I mean, I, I think um, yeah, there are uh, opportunities to improve the, the quality of uh, career information advice and, and guidance um, so that people, you know, who are looking for work have um, much better information uh, to, to help them through that process and also access to, um, to, to free training um, and I think that's still a gap you know, that there's not enough um, funded uh, training um, if the training that is available is, is very restricted um, so I think those are the areas that you know if, to try and help that that pathway from people um, uh, who are unemployed um, in, into the labour market. Thanks Ben. So I would like to pick up on a, a, a kind of COVID specific question next, which is a very kind of pertinent point made about the kind of remote working experiment, that it isn't um, remote working in normal times, it's remote working during a pandemic. And therefore the question about how much can we truly learn from that? So I'd be interested if any of the panelists would like to pick out something that one or two things they think we can kind of learn from this, this period of time and should we should be kind of taking with us either as a kind of positive learning point or something that we we learn we need we've learned we need to improve on or to address if greater flexibility and greater remote working to improve well-being is to be sustained in the future. So what what can we kind of learn from from this experience that that is that is kind of um, going to be valuable for the future? Yeah. Would anyone like to come in on that? Rosie was Rosie. I said I would come to you actually first of all. So um, I'll give you the first option on that, um, and then see if any others would like to add something. And, and yeah, Jake, I think as well, I would like to too. So. I'll, yeah, I mean, I'm not, yeah, I'm just thinking, I'm not sure I've quite got something to mention on remote working lessons, really. I think, you know, we've all learned that how the importance of mental health, and I think that's something that, that um, I hope is reflected um, in the kind of year to come, that that kind of remains a focus for employers. Um, and I think, also, I think we've um, kind of remembered the importance of um, uh, management, as Ben was talking about before, and in, like, engagement with other people and, and kind of talking to each other about, you know, what, what we need to live a life online. So I think that's a kind of conversation that I hope carries on. But didn't quite understand it. Thanks, Rosie. Jake? Yeah, I just I wanted to say um, you mentioned flexibility. I think that is a huge lesson learned that has occurred over the last year. I mean, even an anecdotally, but even previously very rigid employers in terms of how they would um, offer freedoms and flexibility to their staff are being forced into a situation where they have to be flexible um, and have to understand and recognize that people have childcare responsibilities or other, care, or other caring responsibilities, or they might need to I don't know, do whatever they need to do in the day, um, but they'll get the work done in their own time. And I think that is something that has generally been learned. I hope it continues. Um, and yeah, I think that was it. That's it. Thanks, Jake. So I'd like to just, um, Ben, I know you're going to come in now, but I want to come to you on this question anyway, just because it's, it's particularly pertinent for you, I think, um, just to get, ask, get another one in, which is a question raised about... Um, 
the importance of management and then how do we better support line managers because that then impacts on their well-being and their ability to do their job so ben i wondered if if you might give us a couple of words on what more needs to be done to, to help line managers help yeah line that's it's very, it's a very good question. I mean, I think the, the you know the issue is that you know, good line management can't exist in a vacuum. You know, if if you're working in an organisation um, where your your chief executive and your senior leadership team um, doesn't um, have the, the the values around you know respecting um, people and, and investing in the workforce, then um, it's it's very more difficult for those sorts of management behaviours that I was talking was talking about to flourish. So. I think it's it's you know one of the one of the, the the challenges around good work is you know how do we um, ensure that more um, chief executives and finance directors um, are seeing the, the workforce as uh, something to be invested in, something that drives value, rather than as a cost to be managed. Um, and again, I think there's a, a wider debate around you know how you know what are the things that what are the policy interventions that might help uh, that shift. Um, but it's a very complex uh, question, I think. And but it's it's very much thinking about you know how can businesses have a longer term perspective. Um, we know that there's a long you know long term trend of, of uh, a reduction in uh, in uh, investment in in training, um, and you know and part of that is be, you know because um, you know businesses are not thinking uh, longer term. They're not thinking about how they need you know how they might need to. Um, upgrade their product market strategies, and um, you know, and um, what are the, the the ways that they're going to do that? So, um, so a bit of a, a rambling response, but I think it's a really it's a really good question, and it's it you, you could probably run a, another whole session on on that. I think. Absolutely. Um, would any other like panelists like to say a quick word on that? Or happy for us to um, to take to take one final. One, one final question, perhaps, which was, I think this question was asked in particular in relation to, um, to kind of consultation with staff, but I think it kind of actually applies across the board. It applies in terms of um, key issues around tackling discrimination at work, and we've had some important questions there about how do you, how do you break down kind of institutional racism and discrimination. It applies in thinking about improving working practices and helping people to um, to, to work remotely or to work flexibly. It applies about applying the right kind of contract or security. And it's how to, all of which is done on, in this kind of COVID economy under huge kind of time pressure. And how do employers get that balance right between doing the right things, which often require deep systemic thought and breaking down quite deep kind of ways of doing things previously and the need and desire to do that as quickly as possible. How do, how do they get that balance right and what needs to, more needs to be done to help them to, to achieve that? So it's quite a big set of questions, but to me, it feels kind of, kind of fundamental. We feel a sense of urgency in these discussions, but actually the issues are, are deep rooted and require a lot of work. So how do we get that balance between speed and getting it right? Um, and very happy for, for any of you to come in on that. Thank you. Ben, go for it. You look as yeah. Well, uh, well, I mean, it, 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 I mean, it's a really, it's a really good question. I think um, the part of it is 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 about being uh, being honest with with the workforce about the the that challenge be between um, the need to to act swiftly and the need to think longer term about you know what what drives value for multiple stakeholders, particularly the workforce. You know, longer longer term, um, and I think. So you know, have that be very clear about what are you know what what's driving the, um, the, the 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 priorities and 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 then being very clear about well what can you consult on and and you know I think um, and making sure that that if you are going to consult if you if you're not going to consult be very clear about why you're not why you can't um, if you are going to consult make sure it's meaningful make sure that you know you are actually taking. Um, workers' views into account before you make decisions, and you're you're drawing on those on those perspectives to inform your decision making going forward. So I think it's about honesty, it's about transparency, and it's about the quality of the of the consultation when you when you you, you do go there. But also the risks of not consulting. I think be very very wary about not consulting because you know actually speed may not be 
the best, you know, a quick decision may not be the best decision, even if it might seem so in the moment. Thank you, Ben. Jake, and the question's about speed, and I would ask Jake and Gail and Rosie, if you can, to be speedy in your summing up as well on this uh, question. Hand back. Yeah, I think, to be honest, Ben said almost the same thing I was going to say, probably better than I would say it. Um, I, w I was going to, I was going to say, I was, while obviously we want to do these things quickly, I would err on the side of getting it right. And we have spoken today several times about worker representation, which obviously Ben was just talking about. And for something like this, it's critical because you need buy-in and you want to make sure that you aren't going to do anything that's going to cause trouble further down the line, or you're going to have to repeat the process because you, yeah, get it done right rather than quickly and do it twice. I think it's my summary. Thank you, Jake. Rosie, Gail, would you like to say something on this? Rosie, first of all, and then Gail. Yeah, I mean, I'll just go in quickly on, on the other end. I think um, when you were talking about uh, policy, particularly um, whether it's national or, or local policy, really, um, I think, you know, if there's a window, there is the kind of the urgency factor does come in. I think you know, if there's a kind of there's momentum for something to happen, there's a window for change, I think there is a case for urgency. I mean, obviously I agree that, you know, these things are really hard to get right and you do need to think about them and perhaps uh, review your approach. But I do think there is some cause for urgency because, you know, these are things we've been talking about for a really long time and we could continue talking about them for a really long time. So I think if there's a policy window to get things done, I think I would vote with urgency just for the sake of debate. <laughs> Thank you. Gail, would you like a final brief word? And then we'll hand back to Sarah. Yeah, my final brief word was, I, I, you know, we're so, it's been a very long running crisis, but we don't, don't underestimate that it has been a crisis uh, and both government and employers have had to crisis manage, which takes a huge toll. My advice would be to try and get everything three quarters of the way right and then just iterate as you go on, because I don't think it is possible to solve all of these in the middle of a fast moving crisis, but you can get some of the way there. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, thank you to all the panellists for answering those questions so, so fully and thoughtfully and to all participants for such a, an interesting and uh, thought-provoking set of queries. Um, thank you all for your participation in that. Back to you, Sarah. Thanks very much, Douglas. And uh, just repeat my thanks for, for all the questions and comments. We're going to be wrapping up in a few minutes. Uh, before we do that, we thought it would be interesting to rerun our first poll of the afternoon. Uh, to see whether or not anybody's views have changed or whether the balance of views across the group has changed this afternoon. So given that you're familiar with it, we're just going to run this one quickly for 30 seconds. Rebecca, could you pop the poll up again, please? So yes, in your view, which of these actions would have the greatest impact on job quality if taken forward in 2021? Now that's interesting, there has been uh, a bit of a shift. Uh, just to remind people, uh, running down the, the figures first time round, uh, we had at the top 21%, and that's that's gone up a bit to 27% on, on pay rise. Um, a significant drop, this, the, the first, first time round, um, improve employer practice and flexible working, 17%, uh, and that's dropped down to five, which is, uh, which is quite interesting. And then the other significant shift, um, First time round, better enforcement of workers' rights and health and safety at work. That was an 8% first time in round, and that's now gone up to 16. Uh, there's been shifts in all of them, but the other's not quite so significant. So uh, to an extent, of course, these things always reflect the particular issues that you've been focusing on and have been talking about. But uh, I think it's hugely encouraging that uh, we're all open to uh, changing our perspectives after spending an hour and a half listening to people uh, sharing their insights and work with us. So thank you very much for that. And thank you all for participating in the poll. I thought it was really interesting that we, uh, at the end of the panel discussion uh, session there, focused on this question of 
almost, you know, what, what can you reasonably do at a time like this? And I know it's one of the things that uh, Gail raised with us quite a bit during the preparation of the report and that we wrestled with and that we address in the afterward section of the report itself, uh, which is how do you balance your recognition of the enormous pressures that people are under, whether it's policymakers or whether it's employers uh, or regulators, um, with the fact that we all know that sometimes great disruptions hold within them the seeds of the possibilities of change that were required for a long time. And of course, that doesn't simply apply to the issue of good work. It applies to many of the challenges that have been illuminated by the pandemic. Uh, and indeed, many of the areas which we as a trust have been looking at hold within them that tension, but perhaps no more so quite as much as this one uh, relating to good work. And I think the uh, comments that I've been seeing here today, the questions and nature of the discussion have reaffirmed our sense that uh, it's very important not to miss the opportunity to press home some of the issues that we've been looking at for quite a long time in relation to good work and not to mis make the mistake of seeing these as being in any way directly uh, caused by the, the pandemic and therefore capable of resolving themselves as we move into a post pandemic world, because we know that that's not the case. This is a conversation which we want to continue over the coming months. And again, as you'll see in the report, one of the things that we are interested in is exploring where it is that the, the community or the coalition around these issues comes together. It's by holding events like these that we manage to identify people who are our fellow travellers on these issues, because we know that when there is limited capacity, whether it's by employers or by governments or others to engage, it's important that as far as possible, those of us with a shared interest can speak with one voice and can make sure that we join up what we're saying effectively. We are really keen to both form and join alliances advocating for the key policy changes that would help protect and expand good work on these key issues. So please don't hesitate to get in touch with us if you're either an individual or an organisation uh, who would be interested in working further with us on this. That's just coming up to the end of our time now. So I wanted to end by again formally thanking all of our panel today, thanking Jake, Rosie and Ben for joining us. Thanking very much, Gail, not only for uh, summarising the report today, but for the huge amount of work that she has done on this over the uh, course of 2020 and indeed long before that. Thanking Douglas for his facilitation and Rebecca, of course, who uh, had all our slides in the right place and the polls and all the other technical things which we know none of us should ever take for granted, however long we've been on Zoom. And thank you to all of those of you who joined us. It's been great to share our work with you this afternoon and we look forward to engaging with you on these topics over the months ahead. Thank you very much and goodbye.